All right, I'd like to welcome everyone to the final session for our study of the book of John, session 49. Uh, it's sometimes you say, well, you feel good that we got through almost a year of study, almost, you know, 49 hours <laughs> of getting through. But actually, it's, it's gone pretty fast, and we're, we're, we're somewhat sorry to see it go because we have learned so much during this year in studying the book of John. What a great book to study. Uh, with that, we said, what are we going to do next? And we said, look, we've done Revelation. We've done the Gospel of John. Why don't we finish up with all John's writings and do his epistles, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. So that's what we're starting next week. We're going to start 1 John next week. Uh, one commentator has almost a year on 1 John. So he has 48 hours. 42. 42 hours on 1 John alone. We thought we would be able to get through it pretty quickly. Can't promise you we're going to do that, but uh, we're, just, we're not going to cut back on anything. We're going to look at verse by verse and whatever it takes, it takes. That same guy, though, did have 116 hours of For gospel John. Of God. Yeah. So anyway, it'll be, it'll be an interesting twist, but we, we are sorry to see you know, us leaving the gospel of John. It's been tremendously rewarding for, for Net and I. And then we just uh, are so blessed uh, that God has given us this. And, and we're, we've been blessed financially to be able to do it. We don't need funds. We've had, we've had some people that, that, that have given that, you know, really we have been blessed in every shape, fashion, form that uh, we have been. And it's been nice to be able to do this and offer this. We're continuing to obviously look for people that want to join us either uh, online live or Join us by audio or, or video. So anyone you think that are interested, please feel, feel free to invite them either to here in, in the live Zoom or, you know, look at the website and we have uh, the whole history, all of that. It's all on YouTube, the videos and all the audios are on the website. So it's all there. Go back and listen to it. And our whole goal there, just to repeat that, is we want to empower other people to pick up these studies that we're doing and have their meetings in, in their areas, just like we're doing. And that, that's the goal that I have is to be able to do that. So with that, just a quick summary of where we've been with John. I, I'm not going to go into the detail, but just to, just to summarize it. Remember when we started, you know, John's writings are, are fairly identifiable by his style, by the words that he uses, but we started off with the first chapter and was in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. So he starts off immediately saying Jesus was in the beginning and everything was made by Jesus, meaning that Jesus was God. He was there in the beginning. You know, he, he ends his, his gospel really in chapter 20 with the reason he wrote his gospel. And we're going to get into that a little bit, but the reason he wrote is so that you might believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Messiah, the Christ, the promised one, and he is God in human flesh. That's what he is. So that's what he hopes you to believe, and in believing in him, you will have eternal life in his name. So that he starts it off and then he finishes it with basic, ba basically an epilogue. And it's a last chapter that some people debate. John may or may, not, may have done it or someone else added it, but it looked like it was added. But that's just John's style. And we feel certain from the studying that we've done that this is John's chapter. It may have been uh, an afterthought, but it may have been well planned just the way he put it. A lot of the commentators that we're listening to and studying, most of them believe that the, the Gospel of John was written in Ephesus after John was on the island of Patmos, which means if that's the case, the Gospel of John was written after the book of Revelation. It was also written after Matthew, Mark, and Luke. That's, that's, everyone is in agreement with that. Why did he write it, I, I told you, so that we might believe. That's the whole reason. 
He gives us seven miracles. He gives us seven I am's. Uh, I'm not, we'll go through those tonight. We went through that a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but he went through these for the very purpose that you might believe that Jesus Christ is God in flesh. The other thing I found interesting through this study is that Jesus Christ is the judge, and all judgment has been given to him by the Father. What does that mean? Christ lived as a human being. There's no better person to judge a human being than Jesus Christ. So we'll all stand in judgment. We're, we get to judgment because Jesus imputed to us his righteousness. The only way to heaven is through Christ's righteousness. He gives that to us, and he gave it to us when he died on the cross. He imputed his righteousness to us. We use that righteousness as a path, a path that leads to Jesus in heaven who stands at the gate. We learned also, we talked about the Christian creed, which is in uh, Corinthians 15, but John very much covers it here, is that Jesus Christ died for our sins, according to scriptures. He was buried. On the third day, he rose according to scripture. That is the gospel, Jesus Christ. That is the Christian belief. If you look at John's last chapters, he devotes a lot of his time showing you that Jesus died. There is absolutely no question. Medical doctors have gone back and looked at this. They've been all cut. He, he, was, he, he died. There was no swoon theory or no theory that he was drugged and he really didn't die and he woke up in a cool tomb and all that. Remember the Jewish leaders said somebody stole his body and they paid the guards to say that. They bribed them to say that. That's the only thing that ever came out from a, a, a rumor standpoint that someone stole his body. But that was created by the Jewish leaders. They knew the body wasn't stolen and they, they made up the lie. So John Butch pretty much covers that he died, he was buried, and then these last sections is all about the resurrection, proving the resurrection. When you go back to Corinthians, you'll say it says that you know priest that basically he appeared to Cephas, which is Simon Peter or, or, or Peter. He appeared to Cephas and the twelve. He appeared to over five hundred brothers, many of which are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and all the apostles, and then to the one abnormally born, as he was a Pharisee. He appeared to John, to Paul on the road to Damascus. And so that's how Corinthians basically substantiates the resurrection. John substantiates it with all the eyewitnesses that he put in the gospel, but there are a lot more than those eyewitnesses than John puts in here. The other interesting thing we talked about is some reason God and Christ used women in the gospel for almost a lot of the first discoveries. And you remember the first request, the first miracle was Jesus's mother saying we were out of wine, right? That, that was the first. The first time he said he was the Messiah was to the Samaritan woman at the well. The first person to discover the empty tomb was Mary Magdalene. The first person to see the resurrected Christ was Mary Magdalene. And, what, and I mentioned this a couple of sessions ago. There are over eight, there's over 108 women's names used in the Bible. And it's interesting how, it's interesting how during these times, a woman's testimony was not valid in court, yet they're used in the Bible, which again substantiates the authenticity of the Bible being written. It's not been polluted with a bunch of different stories all the same way. There's so much reality in the Bible, and we discover all that as we get through the, the, the book of John. So we come to this final chapter. Uh, the first we looked at last week was uh, Peter got tired of waiting for Jesus. They were told, uh, not in John, but in uh, 
I think it was um, Matthew, to go wait for Jesus at a, at a mountain in Galilee. So the disciples were all gathered up in Galilee. They got impatient. They got whatever. So Peter says, I'm going fishing. He goes down, goes fishing. There's six others that go with him. But the fact is they caught nothing. Jesus is standing on the shore, cooks breakfast for him. We went through all that last week. As we enter into this last section, we get into the restoration of Peter. What does that mean? So with that, we'll turn it over to that. We'll get into the study. Read verses 15 through 17 of chapter 21. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said it to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. So the first thing we want to point out is what did Jesus call Peter? Simon. Simon. He called him Simon. And so, again, we weren't certain that Peter decided, look, I don't know what's going on, so I'm abandoning all this apostle stuff, but I'm going to go back to my career of fishing. Some people suggested that, that he was in disobedience. Others suggested maybe they were just hungry and they were going fishing to get something, food for the rest of the disciples. Some people think that they were just going to relax. Whatever, we don't know that exact answer. But what we do know is Peter had been having a lot of doubts and stuff, and Peter was kind of acting like his old self. And Jesus used an old name, um, the name, uh, he wasn't acting like the rock of the church, and so Jesus didn't use Peter. And, you know, you wonder, well, what, how would he felt about that? I think he would have been extremely hurt. For three years, Jesus told him, look, I'm not going to call you, you're not Simon anymore, you're Peter, you're the rock, we're building this on you. And then he calls him Simon. And I, was, I can kind of relate with that, because at, at one time, I had a really close relationship and I was made that they called me mom and they became very upset with me for, you know, I, I kind of stood ground that, that I should have stood and, and it was upsetting to them. And so it severed that relationship. And then it's, I remember the first time that they called me Annette and it was like a dad, it was like a knife. I mean, I knew it was like, fine. I, I mean, I still stood by what I had to do and what I did which was correct. Um, but I understand that Peter must have almost had a knife in his heart, I would imagine, um, at Jesus calling him Simon and not using his given, Jesus given name. And the, the other thing you admitted that you heard is that he called him Simon, they called him Simon, son of Jonas. And most commentators say when, when you use Simon, son of something, that's a formality. That's a formal name that is used to almost to recognize someone that you don't know, but it's not an, it's not the way you would greet a friend, put it that way. <laughs> so I think that's what she's saying is Peter probably, this was a, a knife going through his heart. Calling him Simon, son of Jonah is like saying, all right, Dave, John Bodie, come in this kitchen right now. You know, when your mom used to call you all your names, um, that's kind of what that's like. So, what are these in Jesus' question to Peter? Do you love me more than these? What do you the think the these are? The other disciples. Yeah. Most people agree that it's the other disciples. The reason for that is that Peter had already said earlier, and I think this is in Matthew, that he told Jesus that he loved Jesus more than the other disciples. So it's very likely he was referring to the other disciples. Uh, that's probably the most likely, but there are several commentators that the these 
but it doesn't say these people. It doesn't say these things, but Jesus may have been asking him, Peter, do you love fishing and the fishing, being a fisherman and that trade? Do you, you, because you, you left the mountain, you went out fishing again. Do you love me more than you love your old job? You know, I, I personally don't know that it refers to that, but it, it you don't know because he, he doesn't say things, it doesn't say people. But Jesus is using this for restoring Peter. So understand these questions and why they're laid out that way is he is really <laughs> drilling Peter uh, in each one of these. So the next question is, why does Jesus ask Peter if he loves him three times? Why would he ask him first, do you love me? And then not only why do you love me, but why would he ask him that same question three times? I think he's trying to get his attention. I'm sorry, say oh, it again? I think, I think he's just trying to get his attention. Do you love me? Yes. Do you love me? Yes. Do you love me? Well, well, well yes, I love you. Okay. That's a good just point. Trying to, make, because trying to make a point. Right. If, if, if somebody asks you something once, I mean, that could just be, you answer it and it's in passing. But if somebody asks you something, the same thing, three specific times, right, you know, together like that, you're going to remember that question. You're going to remember this kind of this instant. Does anybody have another thought here? He denied Peter three times. I mean, he denied Jesus three times. Right. So there are I don't some know. people. Go ahead. I'm sorry. What, were you done, Dennis? Yeah. Okay. There are some people that said, well, probably Jesus, again, using Ricky's answer, was making a point um, in the three denials, he had to recover from those, he had to make three affirmations. And so that, that Jesus was using this as a process of restoring him, just like he, in the last question with what Dave was bringing in, he's using this as a way to restore him. And um, he's letting the each, yes, he loves him, um, kind of erase, not erase, but uh, equate or balance out the third, the, each of the three denials. I think Ricky's answer was uh, was was really kind of the same thing. He got his attention. Right. Right, yeah. and there there's some subtleties as we go through this that we're going to note and. One of this is what differences do we note between each of the three times that Jesus asked this question, do you love me? While that's identical for two times, the third time it's not, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. I'm not going to get into that. But what else do you notice about each of these after Peter said, you know I love you? I'm going to go back to the scripture in case you don't have it in front of you. Do you see anything different between the three questions? Well, they're all three about his sheep. You know, feed my sheep, tend my sheep. Um, is the difference? Is that the difference you're looking for? Feed or feed my lambs, tend my sheep. The the different phrasing that Jesus uses. Yeah, and that's exactly right, Robert. If we look at that, the first time he asked. Peter, do you love me? You know, first, let's recognize he's asking Peter about a, a godly love, and Peter's answering differently, and we'll talk about that. So there, there's some differences here that you don't pick up in the English translation. And we're going to hit that in just a minute. But the first time he asked him, he says, feed my sheep, my, my lambs. That is basically telling him to preach to the new Christians. Lambs are the babies. So he's saying, provide my babies with spiritual food. Feed my lambs. So these are the young Christians, the young church that's growing. So he's instructing Peter to feed them. That's spiritual food now. We're not talking about, you know, actually feeding them grass or whatever. The second time, he moves from lambs to sheep, and he says, ten my sheep. Now, what that really means is the ten doesn't give us all the stuff, but that's what we'll, we'll look at here in a minute. So he, that's the difference. And the third time, 
he's back to spiritual food, but now it's around the maturity. So it's very, that he asking three questions, they look like they're identical, but they really are not. One, one thing I'd like to point out here, and this recently came up in a writing that I was reading, um, that was, uh, that where someone was saying that Peter was handed over to the shepherd, being the shepherd of the people. Um, and whose sheep are these from the scripture? Uh, gee, you said whose sheep are they? Correct. They're Jesus's. They're Jesus's sheep. And so some people were using an argument that Peter replaced Jesus or, or that man could replace Jesus, that Jesus gave authority. Jesus was giving him a command. Jesus was giving him a, um, a job to do, you know, a commission to do. But he didn't say feed your lambs or feed your sheep. He said feed mine. So it's very important to realize whose sheep we are. We do belong to Jesus. Any one of us that work in the shepherding of anybody else are just taking care of people here on earth, but they belong, they're not ours, they belong to Jesus. So that's a... And that's a very, very good point that we should keep in mind that a lot of religion, you know, we, uh, I'm reading a book that God without religion right now, I'm about halfway through it. Uh, very interesting book, I'm not gonna get into the detail. But the issue is, is a lot of, you know, even religion or churches, the churches look at the congregation, and some of them refer to my congregation. You know, my, I, have, I have about 300 people in my congregation. No, you don't. You have 300 people in Jesus's church. <laughs> and so we, the point here is, is no Christian belongs to a minister, to a priest, to a, anybody. A Christian belongs to Christ. Is part of Christ's church, not part of any type of institution. And I think that's part of what we, we need to gather as we go through this is, you know, Jesus's church or all Christians, regardless of the denomination, the organization, or whatever. So what do you think the difference is between feeding the sheep, which is asked to do twice, and tending the sheep? Well, we talked about the spiritual part that he had to do, you know, the, the teaching of, of, of spiritual things, and then tending the sheep would would be the other part of ministry, which is, you know, they need help, they need, you know, just giving them what they need, you know, physically too, if you can. That's I, exactly I, right. So this is the commission given to any pastor or priest or um, people in authority um, within the church, feeding is the spiritual part, teaching God's word, helping people understand God's word. Um, that is very important because people left on their own, if they're not really um, moved or know how to get into the Bible and really dissect it and study it, they're lost. And so they need to be fed to be saying to feed them. But tending the sheep is pastoring, you know, and that is that means that they're, um, you know, counseling them, helping them see the rights and wrongs, helping them in times of crisis, in times of sickness, um, being friends with them, just helping them grow um, in character and, and, and in the church and to grow to be Christians. So there, there is a difference. Um, the, the tending is a, is a much more intimate, one-on-one, -on -one, a, a relationship, much more so than just the feeding. And so uh, it's a good model, I think, to have that, because if you have a standoffish um, pastor or priest and they don't interact with the people at all, you're probably not going to be fed as well because that relationship is going to change everything. Um, the relationship you have with them reacting with you as a person will help them know how to feed you um, because you may not, not everybody learns the same way. So it's going to help them learn how to help you grow and it's going to make you more receptive. So it's, it's a really nice difference, but remember attending is a more intimate relationship and the feeding is spiritual and knowledge. Yeah, and one of the things we had a commentator um, mention this is, you know, we get into this feeding the you know, lambs and feeding the sheep, and we, we talk about that being spiritual feeding. Uh, what does that look like? 
And I found this interesting is that the average human probably spends somewhere between 1,400 and 16 hours a year eating. They eat food for physical being. They have to eat food or they die, right? So what's more important that you live 60, 70, 80 years old? Or what's more important you have eternal life? That's eternity in heaven, in a in blissful, happy environment. So the way he worded this, I thought was interesting in that how many of us actually spend 1,500 hours a year studying Jesus or part of the Bible or scripture? It's a lot of time. That equates to about 60, 70 days, full days, you know, 24-hour days. So look at how much we focus on feeding our bodies physically. And shouldn't we be more focused on feeding our bodies spiritually because the spiritual body is eternity and the physical body is temporal. So I thought it was an interesting you know, comment brought up. So uh, I thought I would share it with you. Next question. Why is Peter grieved with the third time Jesus asked if he loved him? I guess he believed that Christ didn't, didn't believe what he was saying, you know, or it didn't register with Christ. Any other thoughts? I was wondering if um, Peter was simply feeling the weight of the responsibility that Jesus was pouring on to him. <laughs> yeah, and that's possible. I think, yeah, I think all these are, are, are good points. As we study this from a commentary standpoint, but I wouldn't have picked up on it without the studies that we've done, is the first two times Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? He used agapis as, as the verb for love. And that's agape if you think of God's love. That's, that's unselfish love. That's love that's actually really unattainable by us. Um, remember Peter said he loved Jesus more than all the other disciples. Interesting, Jesus asking, do you love me, agape? And Peter answered each time, I love you, filial, which is a friendly love. That's where Philadelphia comes from. It's a friendship. Actually, some translations of the Bible, Peter says, you know I am your friend. Doesn't even say, you know I love you. And so it's very interesting that Jesus is asking him at one level, and Peter is answering him at a completely different level, almost a friendship, not a love. And you say, well, what's happening here? Peter learned his lesson. That's what that's happening. And now Jesus is asking him about that. And he's saying, I don't love you about the way I can't. I've told you I love you more than others, and I abandoned you. I denied you three times, so I know that's not true. So Peter is being honest and saying, you know I love you. You know I, 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 I befriend you. So he is given an honest answer, and that's the right thing, because he, he's already been knocked down because he denied Christ. So he's given an honest answer. But the interesting thing about this, the third time Jesus asking this, Jesus doesn't use a knock Use Filio, which is the same thing that Peter used in his answer. Well, what was that saying? Peter, do you really love me as a friend? Really? So he has dropped this now to either Peter's level that he claims he loves me, but now he's questioning either Peter's level of love. Is, is that what you do? That's what grieves Peter. Because not only is he being asked three times, but the last time he's being challenged whether or not his answer is in the first two, if he really loves him that much. So the thing we get out of this is what is Christ demanding of us? What did he demand of Peter? We can say, feed my sheep. We can say, tend my sheep. We can say, feed my lambs. We can say, follow his word. We can say lots of stuff. We can say we need to obey all of his words. We need to 
obey for his vows. We need for conduct. We need to be, we, we need to repent. We need, we can go on and on. But what is Jesus looking for? Do you love him? He's looking for your heart. Do you love him in your heart? If you do all these other things I mentioned, whether it's obedience, whether it's repentance, whether it's anything, those come naturally if you, if you love Christ. That's, that's what he's challenging Peter here is. And he challenges each of us as a Christian. Do you love me? If you do, all the other Christian traits will flow naturally from that love of Christ. So again, this is drilling Peter, and he, he needs it because he is restoring Peter to be the leader. That's what he's doing. That's what all of this is about. So next set of scripture. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Now this follow me, we don't get it. It's a very strong verb being used here. And it is present tense, future tense. Continue following. Continuously following me. So it's a command to continue to follow Christ. So the next question would be, why would Jesus tell Peter who was going to die, as opposed to just like any one of us where it's going to be a surprise? Why do you think he told Peter how he was going to die? Would it be to prepare him for it? Just um, to let him know, look, you're gonna, if you're going to follow me, you know, because he, he had told the disciples they would be hated of all men for his name's sake. He told them that before. And uh, maybe he's reiterating that point to Peter. You're right. I mean, he was... He was telling Peter how he was going to die, and I'm not so sure this is pleasant, but he was, he was giving him assurance. He was letting him know, he was preparing him to be expecting this, um, that he would die by crucifixion so that Peter would be prepared to not deny again. He knew what the final was to be, and so he would be prepared to preach and continue on um, to to do what he was commanded to do and he would be fulfill that and be faithful to do that and, and remember too as i mentioned uh from historian records uh we're we're pretty much confirmed that peter lived some 30 years 34 years really building the church he was crucified and Legend is he was requested to be crucified upside down because he wasn't worthy as Christ. So the fact is he did tell Peter this. Peter may not have had the full understanding of this at this particular time, but John did because John is writing this most likely after Peter is already dead. Remember, John's the only one that lived and died of a natural age, and we have no record of when he died except we think it was evidence. There are some people, we'll get to this in the very last thing, is some people didn't, don't know whether John would die at all, and we'll talk about that. So why might Peter be happy to learn the way that he will die? That's an odd question, I know. Wasn't Peter, um, yeah, in the book of Acts chapter 5, um, he and some others were thrown in a jail. I think they were flogged. They were beaten for, for preaching the gospel. They were told not to, but they did anyhow, and they were punished. 
Verse 41 of chapter 5 in Acts says, they, they therefore departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name, uh, Christ's name. I'm just kind of wondering if Peter would be, that, that principle would apply here. Hey, I'm going to get to die for his name's sake. Yeah, and I think that's uh, that's true. Remember, he said before that I would die for you, and Christ said, "Really, Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the the rooster crows." So the the fact is, Peter knew he was weak. By Christ telling him this, two things. First, it tells Peter, Christ says, "I you're not going to fail." So. He, is, he has reassured Peter, you will not fail me this time. Secondly, is you will be, the way you die will glorify God. So he's promising Peter that you're going to receive glory in your death, and you're never going to hesitate on what you need to do. So it gave Peter overwhelming confidence of taking what he needed to do and go forward with all the persecution, with all the threats of his life, with everything that would be coming, he took that knowing that Christ said he wouldn't fail. And so he that was that was completely cleaned out of his bed. All his failures were gone. He knew his own solid ground. Verses 20 through 25. Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following who also had leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter saying him said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said to them, if I will that you remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. And then, and then saying this went out among the brethren that this disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but if, I will that you remain till I come. What is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose not even the world itself could contain the books that would be written. Amen. So what is the significance of Jesus' answer to John? Basically what, did you have something, uh, Dennis? No, no. no. Okay. I'm... What Jesus is doing here is he's giving a command. He's saying, look, I'm talking to you. I'm telling you to follow me, not just follow me away from my breakfast down the shore. I'm telling you to follow me, continue to follow me, keep on following me, in the future be following me. He said, so I want you to understand that, and you are to lead the sheep. I'm giving you the command that you're going to be the leader of this flock. And so don't concern yourself with, with the others, the outcome of the others. I've given you your task, I've given you your position, I've given you your command. And so that he should focus on those and not worry what God was doing in, in the other people's lives, the other disciples' lives. Yeah, and, re and recognize all of this is a public proclamation that Peter will lead the, the, the flock. He will lead the sheep. He will be your leader. And the other disciples are, are hearing all this. Remember, we, we discover in Luke that Peter already met with Christ one-on-one. -on -one. And so Christ probably already reassured him to a certain degree. But this was his public proclamation that he's restoring Peter and he's going to lead the church. But how often, how are we often like Peter in regard to his questioning about John? I think we've all had our moments of petty jealousy, <laughs> looking, at, looking at the person next to us and wondering why, uh, why are they advancing more than us or getting more attention than us or promotion or, or whatever. And... You know, we're supposed to focus on our own life, our own business, our own walk with God, 
And if someone else is being promoted in any way, shape, or form, we're not to be jealous uh, of that person. Jealousy is very destructive. Yeah, and I think that's exactly right, Robert. I think that's what the message is that Jesus has given Peter. Look, you have a job to do. Follow me. Don't worry about John. If I choose to do whatever I do with John, that's, that's my business, not yours. We often, just like Robert said, we'll, we'll get jealous because somebody gets, looks like they've been treated better than we are. Uh, but we're, we're not talking about the things of the world when I say that. We're really talking about Scripture and following Christ. Uh, you know, here, let, let's say, and Annette and I talk about this, here we have you know, anywhere from six to sometimes 13 people. We're, we're trying to really get, the, get deep into the word, in deep into the scripture. And sometimes we say, well, there, there's somebody that gets you know, 23,000 reviews on this Bible study, and we have three. What? Well, the point is, we can't be worried about that. If we start worrying about acclamation of men and the public and everything else, that's not what it's about. God is telling us to focus on what we're doing. Leave everything else up to him. And I think that's the message, Robert, that he's telling us. We need to focus on ourselves, focus on what God wants us to do. And what happens around that? That's God's business. That's not ours. Should we not do anything? No. We should take the steps that God expects us to do. Because you know in the Gospel of John, we hear that repeated more and more and more. God expects you to take the steps you can do. But let him do the steps you can't do. And we get that all messed up sometimes. You know, we, we try to take over God's job. We have no business doing that. And then we don't do the things we need to do when God is directing us to do. You know, there is another facet to this that I'd like us to be aware of because um, I've, I won't say I probably, but I'm sure I've been guilty of this myself in the past. Um, I think I would be hopefully not do that now. But when you sit there and you're listening to a sermon and, I mean, has it ever crossed your mind like, oh, I wish so-and-so could hear this. They really need to hear this. Or, man, I hope my husband's hearing this because he needs that. I mean, if that's ever crossed your mind, I, mean, I can almost say it jokingly, but I would, if that crosses my mind, I need to check myself. Because God's not wanting me to worry about so and so four pews over is really hearing this because they really need it. I need to be checking myself. Where do I fit in this? What is being said? How does this apply to me? Is this a problem for me? Am I weak on it? Am I got this strong? If I got if I've, if I've got this down and I'm, this is not an issue, then thank God and be prayerful to God to help you continue to maintain that strength. But if you're weaker, if you kind of fail in a little bit, then you ask God to help you work with that. So I would just say, if it ever crosses your mind, God, I wish somebody was hearing this sermon because they sure need it. This is right here. Jesus is telling us, hey, just look at yourself. Let's not look at the other people, what part of the sermon they need to understand or take. Yeah. That was a good lesson for me. Good point. Okay, next question. What should be noted about the closing few verses of John, about the testimony? Let's bring it back up. It says, this is a disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. So let me stop right there. What is John saying? Well, he's, <laughs> there he goes again, speaking of himself in, in the third person, <laughs> typical of John. <laughs> but uh, I think he's, uh, but, you know, that part about we know that his testimony is true. I think that is so important. Uh, you know, that look, this is the gospel. It's all anointed of God. It's the plan of God. It's the word of God. Uh, I think John is really try, driving that point home. Yeah, and that's that's exactly right. The thing that I think you'll get people have a different opinion on 
is he testifies to these things. He's not talking about feet of Jesus uh, told him to throw the net out and catch fish, or that he told Peter to do you love ask Peter do you love me? That those are part of the things. What he's saying is I'm testifying to all the things I wrote in this gospel. So he's getting testimony for authenticity of the whole writing of this book. And this disciple who testifies to these things also wrote these things. So this one who Jesus is loved, he not using his name through the whole book. He just told you exactly who that is. It's me. That's what he's saying. And then when he says, we know his testimony is true. Well, wait a second. He didn't say, I know my testimony is true. He says, we know. Who's the we? Anyone that reads it. It's everyone that reads it, but there are some commentators that view this. When John wrote this gospel, he wrote it and he went over it with all the elders in the church of Ephesus. And that, that elder group as a whole testified to John's crudeness of what he wrote. So it is we, it is maybe the other disciples, it also could be the elders that are referring to. But the interesting thing is, it's we, not I. Well, he is establishing himself as a eyewitness. Yes. So this is where he's establishing, look, I am an eyewitness, I see these, I wrote these, I know it's true, they, the, Whoever is reading it or whatever, they they also affirm that it's true. Yeah, and he ends this last piece with, and there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. So the second part of this is he's letting you know that all he did was give you certain miracles, certain things that you might believe there's lots more that jesus did now some people say these things that jesus did are not just during the three years of his ministry it's after his resurrection it's the church and it all the things he's done with the church from his resurrection till today each person each christian how they came a christian testimonies if all these things were written down, there's no way the world could contain the books. I'm not saying that's what it means, but there's a lot of people think that it's beyond just all the miracles that John saw him do. And so John is getting testimony that there's a lot more that Jesus did than I put down. But my whole point was to put down stuff that you would believe. And if you go back and you look at the, the I am's and you look at, the miracles and the way they are laid out, they're very purposely laid out in a way that gives you full belief. They, they, they take on different form, each one of them, that gives you that, that belief. So it's very clear that John's ending the, the gospel here. The thing he wanted to make sure of in this last chapter, we call it you know, an epilogue or whatever, he wanted to make sure that we knew that Jesus restored Peter publicly. He wanted us to be sure that the, the resurrected Christ was witnessed by the gospel for the, by the disciples the third time. So he wants to hit home the fact that Christ was resurrected. So he wants you to, to, to believe that. He also wants you to believe that all the miracles that Christ did and that the, the, the restoration of Peter, Peter would lead the church. We talked about love, and one of the questions that was asked by one of the commentators is the way we want to end tonight with this question. Don't look for an answer. We'll leave you with this question. You know, do you love Jesus more than blank? You fill in the blank. And if you do, you probably need to do some work. But the blank could be, Sunday night football, or it could be fishing, or it could be this, or it could be could be my wife, it could be my child, could be about anything, whatever. Do what, Ricky? About anything. Anything. That's right. That's exactly right. So we leave you with that a question to ponder on. 
because that was pointing clear here that love is the most important thing that Jesus is looking for and, and a relationship with each one of us. The only way to know Jesus is through a relationship. And that's in constant communication. With us. So we do want to be careful because really when it's it's easy to see who we love or who we follow. We love, we follow what we love. And so if, if somebody looked at my checkbook or my home or whatever, can they see is that LSU football is really what I love? Is it evident that's everywhere, but there's not, you know, there's no evidence in my life of Jesus. Is it my travel? Is it it could be anything like Dave said, but really anything in your life, I'm just just putting it out there for you this week to, to meditate on. Is there anything in my love life that I love more than Jesus? Because then you want to work on that because you want your love for Jesus, your over encompassing and the bigger love that you have. Any wrap up questions? I, I, I have something I always want to. Every time I've ever read that last part about a, a book not being able to contain it or the world not being able to contain it, it makes me think of all the things Jesus did, but how? why weren't they recorded instead of this? So this, this becomes to me more important because it's what they chose to write about. It's what God put in their hearts to make sure it was documented. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I think that's why John chose these miracles that he did. And then he's pointing out that there were, we, we heard tens of thousands of miracles that were, he was doing miracles every day, multiple miracles, healing you know, whole groups of people. Uh, and so John doesn't get into any of that stuff. He gets into these uh, seven miracles and seven I ams. And then as I think it's right, that he's, he's saying, this is what I want to present to you that you might believe. You didn't go into the detail. The other thing is he did a lot of other miracles, but some of the commentators as I mentioned is what has Jesus done in the last 2000 years? <coughs> you couldn't contain a book. Yeah. Oh, how many, yeah. how many Christians have come and gone, died? How many Christians have their full life testimony of what they did? How much teaching was done? How much commentation? Was done? All, all the stuff that is done and written about Jesus over the last 2,000 years, you couldn't contain it. And a lot of it's not written down anymore. Just look at yourself. Look at the, the miracle of God's work of grace in you. And that, that that would be a lot of writing as well. And you're one of millions of people. So it really is overwhelming to know all that Christ has done and continues to do. When somebody takes one little part of this book, like like baptism, I've had a lot of people say, if you're not baptized a certain way, you can't get to, and they, they, they take one little part. Well, how often is baptism spoke about? So, I mean, it's important. We should do it, but it's not that important. You know, people take one little part and build a whole religion around it, you know, uh, speaking in tongues. So how often is tongues talked about? I've used this a lot of times not to play down on the little parts of the Bible, but to say if they were that important, they would be from the back to the front. And the thing that's back to the front in this Bible to me is God's love for us. And Jesus. Jesus yeah. is something yeah, right. And, 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 and Jesus is sacrifice. So, but anyway, I'm sorry. I got on a little rant. Yeah, there, yeah there's, there's lots of a lots of opinions that it says to, you know, is the New Testament now our word to know God? And that the Old Testament is no longer useful. That's not exactly right. But the fact is, I think it is correct that our God, is, our God to Christ is the New Testament. When does the New Testament actually start. Hey, come here. I thought it was interesting. When does the New Testament start? It starts on the resurrection of Christ, not his birth. We celebrate his birth now every Christmas and we have Christmas presents and all that stuff. The New Testament didn't start with his birth. It started with his resurrection. He lives forever. 
that's where most commentators will say, remember the New Testament was the Holy Spirit given the words to the apostles to write the New Testament. We know Jesus in the New Testament. A lot of good scholars say the New Testament is what we follow. We don't follow laws. We can't follow the laws. We don't follow the Ten Commandments. We say, well, you don't. What do you mean? That's, that's wrong. A lot of churches teach follow the Ten Commandments, right? I've heard a commentator say, no. If Christ loves in you, you are going to follow every commandment. And so you need to focus on Christ being in you and the Holy Ghost driving your thought and not worry about how to not break the law. Because that the Old Testament is if you fail breaking the law, you're doomed. The New Testament is if you love Christ, you accept him, you obey him, you're going to fail, you're going to break the law. Maybe unintentional. That doesn't matter. You've been forgiven. Jesus has paid the price. And so it's really interesting to look at how all this comes together in the different views. But the answer where you were, Dennis, is the problem is religion is made up by man. It has doctrine, and some of the doctrine is really solid. And some of the doctrine looks like it's iron proof, but it's not solid. And so we need to, our, our ministry is, I don't want to get into religion. I want to talk about the Bible and the study of the word of, of the Bible. The, the doctrine, should we be baptized? That's, that's a doctrinal base. I don't believe that's a scriptural base. And how you no, baptize. Oh, yeah. Once saved, always saved. That's a doctrine base. That's not necessarily scriptural base. That's just my opinion. I'm yeah. not, you can make argues, arguments back and forth. You know, can someone forgive sins other than Jesus? That's a doctoral base, not necessarily a scriptural base. So you get into these doctoral opinions, and people build religions around them. They build organizations around them. As a matter of fact, some people going through seminary have to swear by these rules, these doctrines, before they can actually pass sentences. Just like, you know, a doctor raising his hand and taking the doctor oath or attorney or whatever. So they're, they're, they're doing that. We, those all have a purpose in God's world. I'm not saying they don't. That's not what we're focused on. We're focused on strictly taking the Bible one verse at a time. Next week, we'll start into 1 John. So any other comments before we have a closing prayer? Let's close in prayer. Thank you. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the book of John. And we do believe it's, it's such a masterful um, book where we can go through this and see you working and see what you did and what you accomplished. And without a shadow of a doubt, know that you are indeed the Son of God. We praise you and thank you for dying on a cross for each and every one of us, for paying our price, for building the bridge between us and the Father, that, that we have direct access to God through your righteousness. We praise you and thank you for that. I pray you be with us as we go through this week and as we prepare to look at 1 John next week. We're just very excited to continue on with the writings of John. We pray your hand would guide us, um, your, our minds and our mouths and our speech. And we thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen.